We finally meet Odysseus in this chapter. As we are shown the desperation of his situation and his attempts to escape it, we also catch a vision of a new version of heroism. Hello and welcome or welcome back. Today we are reading The Great Books of Western Civilization, continuing with The Odyssey. This is the Robert Fagel's translation, Book 5. The gods sit down at council once again. Athena reminds Zeus of the plight of Odysseus and his family. He is trapped. The suitors lay waste to his home and have plotted to kill his son as well. Zeus reminds her that she has already conceived a plan to deal with all of these problems and that surely she needs no help from him to bring Telemachus home safely. With that, though, he turns to Hermes, the messenger of the gods, and bids him to go and order Calypso to release Odysseus. Hermes arrives at Calypso's cave on her island. She is at first willing to assist with whatever the god needs, but once Hermes explains what Zeus's actual orders are, she becomes infuriated and accuses the gods of being jealous whenever a mortal man sleeps with a goddess citing numerous examples in addition to herself. She goes on to remind Hermes that she was the one who saved Odysseus after Zeus himself blasted apart his ship, leading to the deaths of his shipmates. She welcomed him, she says, and offered to make him ageless and immortal. Nevertheless, she agrees to comply with the will of Zeus and to help Odysseus to get off the island. Hermes warns her to see that she does. Calypso goes to Odysseus, who is sitting apart on a cliff, weeping bitterly for want of his wife and his home an activity that he has been doing every day that he's been on the island. She tells him that she is finally willing to let him go, but Odysseus will not believe her at first without proof, so she swears an oath by the river Styx that she will help him to leave. The two go into the cave for dinner. Calypso then tries once more to convince Odysseus to stay, talking about the pain that he will endure on the way and even at Ithaca. Wouldn't it be better, she says, to stay with her and to become immortal? After all, she says, Surely she's far more beautiful than Penelope, much as he might want to see her. Odysseus actually admits this last point, seeing how goddesses don't age. However, he still yearns to return home with all of his being, no matter what pain or suffering that requires. Then they go to bed. In the morning, Calypso gives Odysseus a bronze axe and shows him where the best trees grow on the island. He spends the next four days cutting them down and fixing them into a raft. On the 5th, he departs. After nearly three weeks of sailing, he comes within sight of the island of the Phaeacians. However, at that moment, Poseidon strides over a mountain on his way back home from Ethiopia and spots Odysseus. He is filled with rage as he realizes that the other gods have plotted to thwart his will while he was away. He knows that Odysseus is fated to make it home so long as he can reach Phaeacia, so he brings together a mighty storm to try to stop him. Odysseus fears for his life as the storm rages on, and he is thrown from his raft. As he swims back to it, clinging for dear life, the sea goddess Eno appears to him, urging him to abandon ship and swim for the shore, even offering him a sash that will protect him from death as he tries to do so. Odysseus does not attempt to swim for shore until a great wave comes and destroys his raft at last. When Poseidon sees him swimming for shore, helpless, barely holding on to a log, he finally relents figuring that there's more than enough suffering coming his way at home anyway. Athena then appears and stills the winds. Odysseus floats for nearly two days until he is close enough to be caught in the breakers near the shore of the Phaeacians. These waves threaten to dash him against reefs and rocks. He manages to float close to a river whose mouth spills into the sea, and he begs the god, the unknown god of that river, to allow him in. His prayer is heard, and the river's current relaxes, allowing Odysseus to float upstream and to reach land at last. After brief consideration, Odysseus walks a short ways inland to bed down among some bushes and leaves, where he sleeps at last. Athena and Zeus's conversation gives us some more clues and hints as to what might be going on with fate here in the Odyssey. We were told already in Book 1 that the year had come in which Odysseus was destined to come home, the year the gods had spun out, we were told. This led me to believe that fate was more linked to the will of the gods rather than the other way around, like in the Iliad. Athena goes to Zeus and tells him, and everyone else, how much Odysseus has suffered. Then Zeus says that they're all going to act together to get Odysseus home, even going so far as to say that Poseidon's just going to have to get over himself and not dare to oppose everyone else's will alone. This made it sound like it was up to a vote, and also that there were other gods that were on board with this plan. In Book 5, though, 
Athena goes to Zeus again and reminds him and all the other gods once again of Odysseus's plight and that of his family. Why? If fate is really up to a majority vote by the gods or even first come first serve, why would she bother asking Zeus again? Zeus asks her much the same question. My child, what nonsense! Come now, wasn't the plan your own? You conceived it yourself. Odysseus shall return and pay the traitors back. Telemachus? Sail him home with all your skill. The power is yours, no doubt. He's as baffled as we are. But Athena is satisfied with this answer for the time being. Zeus goes on, speaking now to Hermes. You are our messenger, sent on all our missions. Announce to the nymph our fixed decree. Odysseus journeys home, so his destiny ordains. Our messenger, our fixed decree. This implies, again, that it is more than just himself that presumes to speak on what Odysseus's destiny is. We know that Athena wants this to happen, that Zeus has consented to allow it to happen, but no other god we have seen seems to be on board. Poseidon definitely is not on board, and Hermes, the messenger, does not take a hard stance for it either. He does as he is told, of course, and he finds Calypso, but he says this, It was Zeus who made me come, no choice of mine. But there is no way, you know, for another god to thwart the will of storming Zeus and make it come to nothing. The rest of his message, as well as Calypso's response, seems to imply that the only will that matters in determining what fate is going to be is Zeus's will. Now this, this explains why Athena would check with Zeus not once but twice on making sure that it's fine for Odysseus to go home. And this is also a shift from what was understood in the Iliad. Not only is Zeus chiefly responsible for safeguarding the will of fate, he kind of is the will of fate. Calypso is the first of Odysseus's encounters on his journey that we get to observe. They sleep together each night, and she intends to make him her immortal, ageless husband. He is kept well-fed and taken care of on this island paradise. However, he does not want to be there, and Calypso is forcing him to stay. Odysseus isn't just making the best of a bad situation either and enjoying what she has to offer. He cries and weeps every day for want of his wife. Homer describes this situation as unwilling lover alongside lover all too willing. This is about as clear-cut a case of sexual abuse as we are likely to find, possibly very similar to what happened to Helen, or definitely for the case of the slave girls in the Iliad. And yet, Calypso does not see it that way. When confronted by Hermes with the orders from Zeus, she makes an attempt to justify herself. Hard-hearted you are, you gods! Scandalized when goddesses sleep with mortals, even when one has made the man her husband. You train your spite on me for keeping a mortal man beside me. The man I saved when Zeus had crushed his racing warship. The current bore him here, and I welcomed him warmly. I cherished him, even vowed to make the man immortal. You're just jealous, she says. He's my husband, she says. I treated him better than Zeus did, she says. It reads like an insanity plea. She does give him up, though, although Odysseus thinks it's a trick at first, which tells you quite a lot about how their relationship actually was. Condemnations aside, though, we should talk about the offer that she makes to Odysseus. Calypso offers to make Odysseus both immortal and ageless. This is rare in Greek mythology. The chance to essentially become a god and escape mortality is not given out lightly. We also know from her dialogue with Hermes that she's offered this to him more than once. This would come with a lot of glory as well, which we can garner from the goddess Eno's origin story that we are given. By accepting, he could stay on the island, avoid all the troubles on the way home, and be her husband. After all, she says, she's a knockout, and Penelope hasn't been getting any younger these past 20 years. He's offered eternal glory, immortality, and a forever gorgeous wife. This is an even sweeter deal than Achilles could dream of. But Odysseus refuses it all. All that you say is true. Look at my wise Penelope. She falls far short of your beauty, stature. She is mortal after all. Nevertheless, I long, I pine all my days to travel home and see the dawn of my return. It may sound like he's dissing his wife, but he isn't. Bear in mind that there really aren't any ugly goddesses. They are de facto more beautiful than mortals, even without factoring in their agelessness. But besides that, he also refers to Penelope as wise, indicating to us that he values her for much more than her beauty. Or, colloquially speaking, he truly loves her. 
As we realize that, these next lines have a greater impact. And if a god will wreck me yet again on the wine-dark sea, I can bear that too, with a spirit tempered to endure. Much have I suffered, labored long and hard in the waves and wars. Add this to the total. Bring the trial on. This is a vision of a new heroism, and this is the Aristia moment that displays it. Compare it to Achilles' Aristia moment. For my own death, I'll meet it freely, whenever Zeus and the other deathless gods would like to bring it on. Odysseus is willing to suffer whatever is sent his way, even if it means that after all this, he still won't get home. His words recall Apollo's in the Iliad about mortals, that they have hearts that are tempered to endure hardship. Given that he's basically refusing to become a god, this subtle owning of his humanity is a very fitting thing for him to say. Then, for the rest of this chapter, this humanity, as distinct from godhood, is lived out. He is forced to build his own vessel to sail on the sea, and he's at the mercy of a god for his entire voyage. Poseidon sends a storm to wreck his raft, Eno gives him a sash to save his life, and finally he cries out to an unknown god of the river to relax his current to let him in. It is his willingness to deal with suffering that allows him to escape, too. Remember from earlier that Poseidon is not willing to kill Odysseus, he just wants him to suffer. So, by accepting his suffering, adding whatever comes next to the total, Poseidon loses his power over him. And that, I think, is why Poseidon finally lets him go. This acceptance of pain is not Hector trying to seize glory, Diomedes pushing the boundaries between man and god, or even Odysseus as he was at the beginning of his journey, as we will eventually see. This is humility, true humility, knowing the truth of who and what you really are, who you're not, and conforming both word and deed to that reality. It's also a full 180 degree turn from the conception of heroic virtue that was more on display in the Iliad, towards something that's much more accessible for regular people. Not everyone has to be like Achilles, he's one of a kind. You can instead endure pain for those you love, and that can be heroic too. We have more to learn about what Homer says that this different take on heroism includes, but this, so far, dedication to family, courageous acceptance of suffering, and true humility, this is a great start. And it's something that we can emulate today as well. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw here, please like this video and comment on it. Subscribe to the channel for more commentary. And I'll see you in the next one.